the Infrastructure Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee on the 22nd of August 2024. Um, I remind everybody that the meetings be recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube eventually, shortly. Um, and I'd like to welcome everybody that's uh, our guests tonight for coming. Right, we have apologies of Councillor Foster and he is being substituted by Councillor Dean in his place. So welcome Councillor Dean. Is, are we aware of any other apologies? Councillor Lee Clark. Oh, yes. Sorry, he's aware. Right, he's sent his apologies. Okay, thank you. Right, we are looking to approve the minutes of the previous meetings held on the 11th and the, uh, of July and the 7th of August. Are you happy to um, move them on block? Yes? No? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Can I have a mover then, please? Councillor Clark, uh, Councillor Wood, sorry, and a seconder? Councillor Margaret Clark, thank you. All those in favour? Thank you. That's lovely. Are there any declarations of interest pertaining to this agenda? No, thank you. Right, you'll note from the agenda that the open spaces item has been removed. Um, following the corporate scrutiny meeting the other night, I felt that it was important that every item got sufficient time to be debated thoroughly and not just tagged on at the end. And as this was an important issue, I have deferred it to the next um, committee meeting on the 2nd of October. And I hope everybody's in agreement with that. Thank you. Uh, response to reports. Right, further to the meeting on the 7th of August, I attended Cabinet to present the two recommendations which were agreed. Uh, the annual garden waste subscription item dis dis decision was deferred as requested to allow the item to return to the committee today. You will, um, I will then present the report to Cabinet on the 29th of August. Right, uh, there are no considerations of matters from the Cabinet to this committee. We now go to item seven the annual garden waste subscription charge. Now, this was deferred because pe members wanted um, a breakdown of the cost incurred of the, um, of the, of the service. So, can I welcome uh, Councillor Dean and, and Mrs Goodwin to uh, introduce the report? Can I just say, um, as, as everyone knows, we, we know why we're doing, we're, we're bringing this to you. The um, charge, the, the fees for the green waste must be self-supporting. That's why we were looking at them again. We have looked at um, getting, you, getting hold of the figures for you, but the recommendations remain the same, that we need to be sure that other people aren't subsidising people with green bins. So I'm going to ask... Um, this is good win to give you the figures that you requested. Thank you, thank you, thank you Councillor Dean, Councillor Kirchman. Yes, yeah, so you asked for some additional information to be submitted into the report. So what we've done is incorporated that information into the report. One of the first questions was, what would a 30% drop on overall subscriptions mean to the service which is supposed to be cost neutral? And there has been a figure of 20,000 put in there, but if I could just make the point, Lichfield saw a downturn of approximately 100 and something pound um, in their downturn. So even if we saw a 10% drop, in subs the, the take up of subscriptions, it wouldn't have a significant budgetary impact on on the the service. So that was point one. Um, there was a discussion around the lift up of CPI, and um, you know um, what would what would that have looked like? And that is put on page seventeen of the report. If we'd have put in CPI every year then the cost would have been, for this year, at £45.52p already. So I was asked for that. So that's also contained within the report. And then in the attachments, we were asked um, 
to give a bit more of a breakdown, I think Councillor Statham has asked for this, around what were the higher related costs in terms of employees, transport, and they are given as a breakdown um, on page 86. Um, the costs I quoted were 60-40, so 60% towards Litchfield. They're not actually, if we look at the exact numbers, it's 32% Tamworth and 68% for Litchfield. Um, but again, further detail was is, has been put in there. If we don't increase it, then the additional cost is £68,000 to the budget. And that's all contained within um, page 86. On page 85, we were asked to submit um, overall summary budgets from 1819 to now, and they are detailed um, on page 85. I'm happy to take any questions or defer to my Litchfield colleagues if need be. Thank you. Just on the uh, figures, obviously it says budget, so I'm guessing 2018 and 19 is budget and not an actual. It's on the, oh, I don't know, it's the, I don't know what page it's on, it's on appendix 5. Page 85. Oh, page 85. So we've got, obviously budget, It was that a budget or was that the actual for 18, 19? That was actual. Oh, no. Um, that was budget. That was budget. Yeah. Why have we got 18, 19 and then it jumps to 24, 25? Is there. Yeah, because we were asked to show what was, what we started at. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So. And then if we've said, I think you said 20,000 it would cost, oh, sorry, the yeah, the cost of 30% dropped off. Does that take into account reduction in, I'm guessing, transport? Because if they're not. Does it factor all that in, or is that just twenty? Is that twenty thousand just off the subscription value? I'm going to pass that over to Stephen because he actually explains it better than I A couple of things. Um, if you lose twenty thousand pound of your income due to people not um, not subscribing, reality is your cost of collection will go down. Uh, however, it won't go down to the tune of twenty thousand pound because of your overheads. So what you tend to find, to oversimplify this, if you go out with a bin lorry and you collect 1,200 properties and you lose 300 of them, you, it, it's not pro rata. So my gut feel is that £20,000, you might save a couple of thousand. What I would say, uh, from a waste background, I have never known anybody lose 30% of their income by introducing a service, um, a, a chargeable garden waste service. So even people have gone from zero to charging those figures haven't occurred. Um, within the report, it talks about Litchfield putting their price up. The price at Litchfield went up four pound in one year, and and even then we only lost a, a, a minute amount of um, subscribers. People will subscribe because they like the service. Uh, so I hope that answers it. Um, mine might be a bit of a novelty question, but in the um, in the budget in 18 to 19, there's zero pounds for bank charges, and then all of a sudden 10 grand appears out of nowhere. Um, could we have some explanation as why we went from no bank charges to a lot of money? <laughs> I did ask our finance um, accountant that, and she said these figures were um, at the, the point that they have been submitted by Litchfield accountant and they were reported at naught. So she's she was wondering whether the actual fees for the bank charges were directly attributed to the service at, at that time. So I think we'd probably be best not to undo that, that figure, but, but they are 10,000 now. So. Any other questions? Right, well, the question is before us then is, are we um, going to recommend that the 
the price increase from 36 to 41 pounds for the green bin charge for it to be self-financing. I'm prepared to move that. Have I got a seconder? All right, Councillor Statham. All right, all those in favour? Against? Abstentions? Right, thank you. That is carried. Okay. We now move on to item 8, the Joint Waste Service Operation, uh, Service Performance Update and Data. Um, and I'd like to... Uh, in welcome Steve G and Victoria Woodhouse from the Joint Waste Service and hand over to Steve to provide a summary of the report. Thank you very much. Um, to give you an idea of what we're looking to present, uh, this goes back historically from when blue baggers came into Tamworth and Leachfield for the Joint Waste Service and one or two of the problems that occurred. So what we've been doing over the course of the past year is giving you an update on where we are in terms of operations for the Joint Wave Service. It's a lot of data. Uh, some of it, uh, we won't go in complete detail, but you're more than welcome to go away and have a look at some of the statistics. Uh, but what I would like to say straight away is, as a Joint Wave Service and as a collection uh, scenario, I've been there a year. You've got a very good service, uh, both at Litchfield and Tamworth. It works well. It doesn't have many problems. Um, most of the collections are completed on time, and I would hope to think that, as members, you don't get that many complaints about the service. Um, some of the key facts that we start to look at that we try to measure ourselves, number of missed bins, because missed bins are expensive and they're also a customer uh, failing. We do miss some, uh, and we do manage them. We do work very, very hard on them. Uh, to give you a comparison, we missed in the quarter that we're looking at with this set of data, 326 per um, 100,000, 100, uh, 10,000, that was 357 the previous year. So again, it's been maintained. We also, very importantly, we maintain a log of our missed collections, of assisted collections. Um, the nature of assisted collections, these are the most vulnerable people that we have, and we need to ensure we offer a service there. Um, Unfortunately, we do miss some, we shouldn't do, uh, but in the period we're quoting, which was the previous four months, we've missed 16% of the missed bins were assisted collections compared to 20%. So what we're saying is we are managing our missed collections to a large extent, and the figures are very good against our neighbours and against the industry. We talk about participation, um, people who actually participate in the schemes that we run. The recycling scheme uh, that we currently offer, we, deal, we still actually uh, anticipate that around about 98-99% of the residents do actually participate in. So people do engage in the service. Uh, we've talked about garden waste figures. Um, I won't go too far into that uh, because we've obviously just covered garden waste uh, figures. Uh, but what we do have is we've got around about 44,000 uh, subscribers this year. So again, over the last two, three years, the number of subscriptions of garden waste has stayed pretty static. Um, just to bring you up to speed for those who may or may not be aware, we also now offer the ability for garden waste customers to sign up, not only by a traditional card method online, but also by direct debit. Uh, so that was the move that we made last year. Um, and around about 8% of residents are taking that, that option. Uh, real key factor that we have is contaminated bins. So this, we're talking about the blue bins here. Um, and for those who may be new to waste, the problem that you have is as soon as somebody contaminates a bin, i.e. they put the wrong product in there, they potentially lead to a problem where the whole load gets turned away. If that happens, Ballpark figure, that's three and a half thousand pound it would cost us, and we'd probably lose around about eight, nine, uh, eight, nine tonne of, of, of recycling material. So you can imagine it's a real, real key factor that we can that we work on. Uh, we look at this because historically, and before the blue bags came in, um, oh, it was in the region of about forty thousand pound a year that we were, were losing in terms of recycling by loads being rejected. Uh, so a lot of work went in by Vicky and her team. Um, 
and the good news is that the number of uh, contaminated bins that we've got out there has fallen dramatically. It's round about 1,040 bins per month. Uh, compared to last year, that was versus 1,600. Compared to previously, it's significantly lower. Um, importance of it is it because it means that the quality of the material that we take into our recycling facilities is acceptable and is of a good standard. If you send it there and it's of a good standard, you don't get the financial hit of it being rejected and you've got more chance of getting a decent price for it. Uh, so again, what we do measure is we measure contaminated loads and the contamination that we get within the product that we take to the recycling facilities. Lovely figure on the fibre, so on the paper we have a 0% contamination. Uh, do I believe that figure? Certainly not, uh, but that's what our suppliers actually quote. So we have lost no paper since the blue bags came in. We have had no load rejected whatsoever. Um, the blue bins, we are running at a figure of about just under 3%, 2.89% uh, contamination in there. Um, again, that's pretty much industry standard. Uh, if I'm honest, if you're below 4%, you're in the right place. If you can lower it, even better. Uh, very important information uh, is on the tonnage, uh, and we do talk about tonnage in waste a lot because it's actually probably the biggest KPI and the biggest driver of what we do. Um, the first tonnage figure that we'll talk about is the residual tonnage, uh, and we're collecting 3,253 tonnes per month in the Joint Wire Service um, on average last year. This was actually higher than the previous year uh, in 2023, but lower than it was in 21-22. The real key to that is because although we'll talk about recycling rates, the real driver that you want to do is reduce residual waste. So probably my favourite KPI that we should be monitoring is how much tonnage we're actually doing and how much tonnage per household. Uh, we do talk about recycling Percentages though, which is a, a, a national KPI that we compare against. Um, there's a table in the report which shows both the joint waste service recycling percentage and also the Tamworth recycling percentage. So the last financial year, 23-24, the joint waste service had a figure of 41.7%. Tamworth had 37.41%. Uh, historically, Tamworth's always going to be lower than Litchfield due to the demographic. Um, and the fact that it's more urban, you, you, you tend to find um, that what occurs in the total recycling rate, it includes green waste. Well, if we go outside and we walk around Tamworth, there's a lot less gardens than there happens to be in certain leafy areas that, that, that Litchfield has more of. Um, the good news is the 37.41% was an increase on the previous year. Um, which unfortunately was a bad year all round for the industry. Um, and so far this year, we are trending at round about the same place. The, the figure of 40.7% looks, looks like an improvement, but that's unfortunate. Well, not unfortunately. The reality is grass grows at certain times of the year, so it, it pushes the, the rates up. Um, The percentages on recycling will make more sense as we get into recycling campaigns, uh, but as a rule from what happens, recycling is cheaper to collect than residual waste due to the disposal costs. We also look at the dry recycling rate, um, the figures are on there, and what you actually find on the joint waste service is 22.3%, uh, 36%. Tamworth actually has a higher, uh, is higher than the average, which is a positive, but again, that is mass because it creates less garden waste. Um, there is a recycling campaign which is due to come out in imminently. Um, it, it's actually ready to roll and to be pushed out. It's an excellent campaign. We would ask that all members from all parties and both districts support it because it's a good message about trying to encourage our residents to recycle. Um, it got delayed partly because of the elections 
Um, but we are due for a soft rollout over the summer months and it will go into schools in September. Uh, no real surprise here, but if we can get the message over to the children, the idea is they come home and they tell us what to do um, and, and we see improved behaviour as a result of. Financial performance, uh, which ties in again with the scenario of the, uh, the, the conversation and the green, uh, the green waste charging. Uh, last year, the joint waste service overspent by £154,000. Um, it's a big sum of money, uh, £64,000 that uh, Tamworth contributed to. However, what I would say at that stage, it's on a budget of around about £7.5 million. Once the income comes out, it, it's on expenditure of about £3.5 million. Um, so it's certainly within acceptable levels, although we don't rest on our laurels with that. Um, again, as a comparison, that was a slightly better result than the previous year. And as you do get into the finances of the Joint Way Service, we can control our costs, so we can control how many people we put out, we can control what we get to the malts per gallon. What we can't control is, to a certain extent, the price of fuel, for instance, and we also can't control commodity prices. So what our recycling gets sold for is out of our, is out of our hands, uh, that they are world markets. Um, the result of that does mean that this year is going to be challenging. Um, so, so far this year, and we haven't got in the figures uh, on the report, but we are going to overspend £75,000 so far, predominantly due to commodity prices. Please, please be reassured, rest assured that what we are doing is we are working on that and we have got certain measures in place to control it. You will also find it follows a trend. We overspend in the summer because we run more trucks because of the green waste and it falls away as we get to, um, to the winter. Um, predominantly, there is a lot of data, and I, 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 I often say to, to, to people who notice the industry, when you get the chance and you get to look at all the figures, that's when it starts to make more sense and this lot all comes together quite nicely. And there are some key figures, but I can't stress enough, you have got a service which is on par and better than the majority of Staffordshire. Um, couple of projects just to keep you in the loop about what's, what's going on. We have fleet procurement that most of you will be aware of. We are currently in a standstill period, uh, so I'd suggest that by the time we get next to the, uh, our next meeting, we can give you an update on where we are on there. Um, touch wood, the deal that we've got has actually been very, very competitive. Um, I have been asked previously at this, uh, at this meeting about alternative technologies for the vehicles. There is a piece of work going on at the moment uh, where we're looking to put a road map together in order to be able to look at alternative fueled vehicles. So that piece of work has actually started and that will start to give the road map about where we take the fleet over the next seven, ten years. Um, I've mentioned the, re the launch of the new recycling campaign. I am quite excited about that. It's probably as good a campaign as I've seen in many a long year. Uh, so I'll be honest, if we don't pick an award or two up from it at the industry, I'll be a little bit disappointed. Uh, we have some major contracts that are up for renewal. Uh, so the green waste disposal, uh, the tenders have actually come in today. So over the course of the next couple of weeks, we will be awarding a new contract for the disposal of garden waste. Um, we have dry recycling contracts coming in, so with a contract for the sale of the dry recycling, the glass, the plastic, the cans, that's also for renewal. Uh, the reason I raise these is, and I'm going to put a joint waste head on rather than a Litchfield or a Tamworth head, the fleet contract is probably, well, it's the biggest contract that the council has, um, and these contracts on the sale of recyclables are up there in the top five, six contracts we have in terms of value. Um, we have simpler recycling coming around the corner, which is predominantly to oversimplify, no pun intended, is food waste uh, and flexi plastics, one of the two changes that the previous government proposed. Um, there is a spending review that's about to occur, but the feeling within the industry, the respective who, who, who won the last election, that the, the um, proposals for the, the new scheme would be would be agreed and would continue. It was cross-party originally. So the reality is that in the not too distant future we'll be discussing about some significant changes in the industry. Um, the biggest one being the introduction of food waste. 
Um, we are reviewing the bulky collection service, but I'll leave that because you've asked us to, uh, to bring a paper to you to discuss the the service that we do provide for your consideration. So I'll, I'll leave that at this uh, at this stage. I apologise that there's a lot of data in there, but I promise that once we've actually been through once or twice and you've actually read and looked back on the history, it, it does make sense. But reassure you, your service is actually in a in in, 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 in very competent hands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Councillor Bailey. Thank you. Just around the financials, so <coughs> you mentioned the 100 and, was it 154. Yeah. So 64 of that, obviously, we've, we've talked about, so we know what that is. But is there a feel for what the other 90,000 was on the overspend, what that related to? On the what, sorry? The 90,000. Which 90,000? So you said there was an overspend of 154, 64 relates to TBC, which leaves nine. Oh, so my apologies. What, what it actually happens, the, uh, the Joint Way Service is a combination of Lichfield and Tamworth. Uh, the costing model uh, that was originally put together is based on property counts. Um, so it changes each year, but as a rule of thumb, it tends to be a 68%, uh, so get me figures right here, a 62% Lichfield. 38% Tamworth. So on that over, over that, that expenditure of 154, £90,000 was picked up by Leachfield, 64 by... Um, yeah, it's relating to what's just been discussed. That is a lot of overspending. I know you say it's in proportion, which yep. obviously I, I'm not, I don't work in waste. It very well could be in proportion. And I can see that, like you said, it's gone down from the previous year. What measures have you got in place to ensure that that's going down? Because uh, all I'm seeing as a councillor is 64 grand, and I'm like, that's a lot of money for us to take the burden of. So what measures are you doing to try and keep that decrease happening? It's a ongoing, constant, evolving set of methods that you will do to actually run a tight operation. I always try to say to people that if, if you've stopped thinking of us as bin crews and think of us as a logistics company, you take back the scenario that what you'd, you'd have done back in your days when you are in retail distribution with some of the major third party players and you know the, some of the supermarkets that I worked for, you're looking at ways where you can cut your costs. So it can be something such as the recycling campaign that we're talking, because uh, again, if you reduce if you reduce the amount of rubbish that you're collecting, probably shouldn't call it, but the amount of residual, you're taking cost out of the equation there. Potentially some of it for county, but you're taking cost out. If you're making your rounds as efficient as you can, um, if, if you work on the idea that a bin lorry per year, about 80, 90,000 pound a year, if we can rejig the rounds, um, which on occasions you can, because over time they get inefficient, you can suddenly take out 90,000 pound a year. There is a flip side to that, they keep building houses, so we actually have more places to go to. So you're doing that balancing act. Um, so the big things are, other things that are going on, the, the, the biggest part of the budget is made up, labour. So if we can actually send out one less crew or use one less man, that seems to have a significant impact. Um, fuel, I think we all know, has become extremely expensive. So one of the projects that's going on at the moment is we bought in some... Um, we have a software package we bought in. It's, it's, a simple, it's a black box, but it's quite a jazzy black box to actually look at people's driving styles. Um, what we achieved through that with a 10% reduction in fuel, when you've got a £500,000 a year fuel bill, that's a significant element. That is constant and evolving, and what we will do, we will improve, and then we'll get a little bit worse, and then we'll go back again, and you constantly go down that level. Um, you're looking at contracts, so the quality of the material takes out some of the costs that, that, that we could have had. So you go back to the conversations, and historically when you were on a, a single stream scenario, the quality of your product was, um, I shall put it politely, was perhaps lacking somewhat, and by yours, I mean Litchfield and Tamworths and uh, Canex. Uh, so we changed the system, which improved the products which actually meant you got better value for it. Um, 
I did make the comment that some factors you can't actually control. So we talked about fibre, uh, so the paper and card that we all put in the blue bag. Uh, it's currently going for about £25 a tonne for an income um, on the market. If I go back 18 months, we're getting £120 a tonne a ton for it. Um, so unfortunately, you have these global prices that are going up and down. Um, it, it was sold to me, it's unfortunately, it's what's happening in Taiwan or what's happening in China that has an impact on commodity prices. But what you've got to do constantly, you've got to go back to the market. And when we go back to the market for the sale of our material, you've got to have an attractive product that people want to buy. If you do that, you hopefully cut down on those costs. No, that was really insightful. Thank you. I think it would Thank be um, interesting to see kind of a concrete written version of what your plan is each year and how you kind of do that yeah. risk management of the possibility of us overspending so i think it would be nice to have a plan set in place whether you do already or not um it would be nice for us to be able to see that you know if we're already predicting that there will be price increases i think if we know what strategies we have in place to avoid that and then that would be fantastic yeah, yeah the only thing about pricing the price increases of our operation costs we can the commodity markets, if I could answer that question for you, I'm leaving because I'm going to become a millionaire. No, um, I understand but, that. I just yeah. mean kind of in general terms, but no, thank you. I think if we can ask if um, they can be put in our updates, that's, that, that information, that would be very useful. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Bailey. I probably should know this, but the labour costs, um, are the crew employed by... Litchfield, or are they contracted in? I mean, look here, because I can give you the head count because I found it yesterday. Uh, we, we, it's actually it's an in-house operation. Um, so what you actually have is uh, Litchfield are the main, uh, are, are the employing agent, at, and we've got 88 frontline staff. That's been men and loaders, um, plus the back office support. We do use agency, um, so we do use temporary staff because our volumes go up and down depending on the time of year, depending on holiday, etc., etc. So again, in, uh, ties in with what Councillor Stephen was asking, the agency expenditure at the moment is, is a little bit higher than we'd like it. Uh, we had a good two-hour, I'll say, discussion uh, this morning about how we go about trying to address that issue. Uh, but we are an in-house operation, and we do predominantly run our in-house staff um, Try to work on the idea of about 85% in a perfect world, 15% agency across the year. Have you got an idea of how much you spend on agency? Um, I do. <coughs> do I want to admit it? Now, uh, reality-wise, it will vary from year to year, uh, and that's what the fear is, because potentially this year, if we don't get hold of it, it will be around about half a million. That sounds half frightening. Yeah. Um, and before I get shouted up from over here... If we take a scenario that what we are almost dealing with is bums on seats, mm. so you actually generally find that the cost of an agency member of staff or a cost of your own staff member isn't that difference. If we go back a few years before the legislation changed with agency staff, it sounds ridiculous, but it was cheaper to use agency loaders than it was to have your own staff. It's now pretty cost neutral. Uh, but yeah, I'm fully aware that when you look at a, ballot, uh, a budget sheet and you're looking at the costs and somebody got half oh, a million on agency. So uh, that's probably my biggest challenge at the moment. Councillor Adams. Thank you. I think my answer been <laughs> I think you already answered my question on what the difference between the agent cotton and a normal employee. It's, it's very similar. Um, I, I suggest what we could do is we could actually, I, don't, I haven't got those figures to but what I can do, we can put the differential and share it with you. Um, I think that'd be interesting because it might be worth having more staff compared to having an agent coming in all the time. It's a, it, it's a beautiful balancing act, and this is one of the discussions we had this morning. Do you increase your headcount to reduce your agency? Yeah, sounds brilliant. Um, and then I've got my operations manager, a front line, saying, Steve, my problem is then, it gets to January, no one takes any holiday, we're on there, and I've got people you know, sitting around twiddling the thumbs. They won't twiddle the thumbs, we'll send them off on other jobs in other areas. 
Um, but it is a balancing act and we're working through to try to find out what that sweet point is at that stage. I don't think no agency is the answer, but I also think a lot of agency is, 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 is not ideal. Mr. Adams? Yeah, so um, I do think in it agency it costs more compared to having a employ normal employee. It the difference quite huge or small. We would it'd be a good idea for us to have a finance on what the difference is costing wise, and you know it might be worth having more normal employees. Yeah. I said, what we'll, what we'll do, um, Councillor Adams, we'll put together so you've actually got a, a nice comparison to the penny. And the reason I say that is because on one hand you've got, we're paying the same wages, we have to due to the legislation, which is fair enough. Um, you've then got the difference between the pension costs and the other costs that we get from being a local authority versus the markup from the agency. Uh, but yeah, we can, we can share that. Anybody else? Councillor Clark. There's always been this little staff versus agency query, I think. It's not exactly a contest, but there are quality issues on occasion. At least with a member of staff, you are you are able to expect 100% quality. Whereas with an agency, I have found at times that you really can't. Although I appreciate your points with regard to the background costs of having a member of staff full time with all that that entails. But do you find that uh, quality is affected by whether you have agency or staff? Um, I'll give you the answer that I was given this morning, um, which was some of our agency load was better than our own. Um, there is an element in reality, that, and the perfect model and what it should be is your own staff are better trained, more reliable, etc, etc. And I, I was being slightly flippant with that because our own staff are better on the vast, vast majority. Um, I've always preferred a scenario of having your own staff that are trained up that you've got control over. I think one of the it, the hidden costs of agency isn't the cost of employing them, it's the getting them trained up, it's the extra induction day on a turnover of staff. Um, but I would again add that a lot of our loaders agency staff are long term, have been there for a long while and I challenge you to spot which one's which when they're driving around Tamworth. Um, so we have got a lot of decent agency staff as well. Councillor Bailey. Just really following on from everybody, from my fellow councillors, I guess it would be good to see a plan with some, you know, with, um, with some figures in there just with, you know, with the temporary staff, if you turned it into so many perm heads with the on costs on there. But also, and you've touched on this just actually, and I, I don't know how easy it is and probably very naively of me, but if they could be cross-trained, so in January when, you know, things slow down, they could go into areas like, you know, street scene and things like that. I, d I don't know how, again, I don't know how easy or how difficult that is, but that might solve issues somewhere else, possibly. Um, again, Kent Bailey, very valid point. There is a slight oddity here that we just for reality to check uh, to keep into balance that the joint ways service is Litchfield and Tamworth. Tamworth Street Scene Department is Tamworth Litchfield Street Scene Department is Litchfield. We would have to do something where we work and the good news is that Vicky and myself are joint ways service uh, when when it comes to ways. We are Tamworth, we are Litchfield. When it's street scene I'm Litchfield because it's a Litchfield department that I've run. So we've got to a stage now when we've got that spare resource, it's one of those little complexities on top because the idea of multi-skilling and upskilling people to different jobs, can't argue against it, it makes perfect sense. Um, there is an argument then that I've got to send 3.2 people, Tamworth Way and 6.8. But We'll have point 0.2. You'll have the point, <laughs> yeah, okay. Right, um, I've got it. But there is something there. I mean, I even toyed and pleased. Oh, I don't want to say scrap from the records, but we can't. Um, there's almost an argument. Okay, when you've got these spare bodies around, what could you do for the community? What could you sit that actually have social value outside of joint waste? Um, it's it's there, and it's a problem we're working on to actually get to a stage where we can, as I said, get to that sweet spot. Okay. 
I'll kill the word demarcation lines instead of rotation of jobs, more interest for the employee, uh, multi-skilling of the employee at an easy rate because there's always somebody in doing the job that you're asking them to help out at and that in a way is sort of staff to staff skilling. It doesn't cost a great deal to interest someone in doing more than one area of time. Certainly we have done that in Tamworth in different areas completely so that staff get to know more than one type of job. It keeps their interest up, it keeps them um, a little more alert and also you're giving them a better CV. Um, so it's something that I would think might be valuable but I take your point and when you're paying agency staff the same as your staff staff, are you not paying their pensions and national insurance as well? <laughs> Because I used to work for an agency a long time ago, I remember that. I'm going to be careful then. Um, Rip, what you've just said there, Council, I 100% agree with you are correct. Um, the pension costs, etc. Uh, on the first point about the multi skilling, 100% the demarcation. Just yes, agree. The agency costs, we pay a set rate and then the agency sort out the ongoing cost for that employee. But the, the costs still exist, don't they? Anybody else? I've got a couple of questions just to finish off. Um, wrong page. Are there any proposals to use separate bins in public spaces for collecting recycles? Um, for instance, in our castle grounds, you, um, would it be profitable to do so, where that people could put in paper rubbish and plastic rubbish separately and glass? Are you deferring to street litter? Um, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, that would be a Tamworth uh, decision, not a not a joint way service uh, yeah, position. However, is it Anna, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm coming. Yeah, we are just looking at um, bins. Um, there was a study done, started last year, with a number of bins. Um, and in the castle ground we're looking at the way we use those bins the number of times they're they're emptied and how they could segregate um, which would help street scene collect that so yes that work is underway just to back as well with Anna Litchfield have the same problem as Tamworth so the question is being asked there and we did speak with Anna and the team about whether you actually join forces to have the same campaign and the same idea and we will share so Litchfield did the problems which hopefully many of you will attend. Uh, we are trialling recycling at the proms this year. When we find out how well that goes, that's when you feed it back to town. We're all saying, okay, the, the, the day you have in the castle, what you can try and do there, and the same with street litter. So it's the same problem we've all got, and that's where Litchfield and Tamworth should come together to resolve. And the other thing, I'm, I don't know whether this comes in the, this report or next report, are there any proposals or any work to... Um, undertaken to see if Tamworth could have its own recycling centre. Um, I was thinking it would contribute to the reduction of unnecessary journeys by the public. You know, when we're looking at climate change and our carbon footprint. We all have to drive over to Litchfield or to Grendon, whereas if there was somewhere local, it would save us. Um, household uh, recycling sites come under Stas County Council. Um, I, I'd add we all have the same problem and I, I, I'm banging on the door of Stats County Council, I want a transfer station, um, but it's up to County Council to provide us one, which is basically somewhere where they can chuck all the waste rather than having to drive off to various disposal points. I think when you look around Staffordshire, there are certain areas that perhaps noticeable that haven't got a household waste site. Is there any other questions? Right, we're asked now to um, endorse the report and updates provided. Right, moved by Councillor Wood, seconder, Councillor Clark, all those in favour. Thank you. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Right, we now come to item nine, which is the review of the bulky waste service, which is over to you, Mr G, again. Hello again. Um, right, the... Uh, Review of the bulky waste service. Um, 
and this was a question that was brought by uh, previously from this committee just to give an overview of what what we offer um, so what we brought forward today um, because wrote the report um, but literally to explain the service that we provide and then give us the opportunity to all go away or to have a think about what we could do what I would say um, because again it's a joint way service if Tamworth have ideas that they would like to take forward uh, at this stage and put forward that would have to go back to the joint waste board with Litchfield uh, as, as well as the decision making process to see whether we could change things the good news is that um, Councillor Foster um, from Tamworth and Councillor Whitehouse from Litchfield are talking and we'll have a lot of shared areas I can't stress enough the waste shouldn't need to cross borders it, it, it should be an agreed outcome that we can all come to whether we happen to live in Cornwall, Ayrshire or Tamworth um, anyway the, the, the service that we currently offer uh, we provide a bulky collection service uh, last year 4,831 service requests were made um, strangely the higher percentage came from Tamworth so 2,471 I have no idea why uh, I walked into that, didn't I? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but there are more people taking up from Tamworth. Um, service that we offer is a bulky way service. Uh, in the appendices, there is the detail of what it involved. So it involves items such as bed, sofas, furniture. Um, we also offer a scrap metal service, which is dishwashers, fridges, freezers, similar products. Um, you book the service online up to a month in advance. Um, it does bring in an income. So last year it brought in around about £90,000 uh, income. Um, partly that when you look at the figures it's because people request more than one item. So it's, it's not everyone has one item, some have one, some have more. Uh, it costs £18 per collection and £7.50 uh, for an additional item. At the moment, residents can select up to four items on a bulky collection, uh, and that can do two on the scrap. So if it's your, your bed and your other stuff, you can do four. If it's your fridge and your freezer and your metal stuff, you can do two items. There is a maximum size for it, which is 75 inches or 190 centimetres long. I think earlier I was trying to work out how high that was. It's a little bit taller than me. Um, again, it's because of manager landing reasons that we have those, those provisions in. Uh, we ask that residents place the items outside their property uh, along with their usual bins and then we collect from the curbside. Um, the collection methodology, the metal items we collect on, we have a small van that runs around, little, a little pre and half tonne with a tail lift so, uh, that, that runs about a small van that delivers the bins and the bags to residents' properties. That vehicle collects the metal items. Um, it collects the metal items because they're big, solid and metal. They put it on the tail lift, they put it onto the back of the vehicle and then once they're collected they generally take them to a household uh, waste site or the council depot. Uh, the household waste site is actually next door to the depot so that makes sense to go straight there. Um, at that stage they go into the hands of Staffs County Council who in theory should reuse if possible or recycle or do the appropriate measure with them. Um, probably is worth mentioning that certain items do class a hazardous waste, such as fridge freezers. Um, the other side of the service, which is the you know the, the beds, the sofas, wardrobes, whatever it might be that we've actually put out there, um, you're allowed to book up to four slots on sorry, my apologies, you're allowed to put out four items um, and there is a maximum on each round of four slots. So one, two, three, four people um, book the slot on there, and then the slot's gone, the fifth person would have to wait. Uh, with those, what we do, we, when we're going around on the bin lorries, uh, literally they go into the back of that vehicle, so the crew pick them up, throw them into the bin lorry. Um, I think if you want to watch it, there's a gentleman who posts videos of all our vehicles driving around Tamworth. Uh, he put a video on the other day of a of a mattress being put into the back of a bin lorry. Um, that then goes to the incinerator. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. 
we all have our hobbies. Um, it goes to an energy from waste plant where, along with the residual waste, it is burned and turned into energy. Um, There was a question asked about how do we know what items to collect. Well, the customer service uh, staff that actually take the calls are trained, so they do know and they do have the brief about what items we can take, what items we can't. Um, a question was also asked about does it contribute, does the service or a change in the service, would it have an impact on fly tipping? Um, it's a good question, uh, and one I don't actually know the answer to, and I don't think I'm on my own on that. We don't have information on the number of failed service requests, so people who ring up and say, can you click my fridge freezer, we can't, we don't know what happens then. I have to be honest, from a, a an experience perspective, I think the person who generally rings up and says, can I pay for a bulky waste collection, isn't the kind of individual that then goes and fly tips it over the, the back of the park or whatever they may do. Um, However, fly tipping is a problem, and it's a problem that Anna's team has got at, um, at Litchfield, and Gary's team, at, uh, sorry, at that Tamworth, and Gary's team at Litchfield have also got fly tipping has gone through the roof. It's off the scale. It is ridiculous. It's a problem all around the country, and one that we really, really do need to tackle, because I, I'm sure you're all in agreement. It's oh, it's just wrong, isn't it? Um, I'd love to see people prosecuted for the fly tipping. Does it link into this service? I've no evidence to say that it does, but I can see where the, you know, the, the, the people may make that consideration. Um, one thing I would say about the service, it was set up in the same as the joint way, so it's a low-cost service. If you want to try and get rid of bulky collections in a cheaper way than it currently happens, you would be hard-pushed. Um, the reason that being is what it is, it's an incremental cost. So if you put a bulky weight collection out, bin lorry comes round, it's doing your bins at the same time, it goes into the same vehicle. With the items that have to go into a van, we schedule them in to days when we are delivering the bins to, the, the new bins to properties, or the bags to properties. So we minimise our cost by doing with that stage. Um, that's what the service is. The question that was asked is, okay, what options do we have? Uh, option one, is that we continue as we as we are. We have a service that actually brings in income that is is relatively well is, is well used and um, which is, is is very low cost. Um, there are other options that we could consider. Um, one is that you can introduce a separate vehicle to do the collections, or you uh, alternatively you can use an outside party to do that for you. I've worked at other councils where I'll, I'll, I'll use Newcastle Underline where it's a separate vehicle that went around and did all the bulky collections, you can go down that route. Pros and cons, um, it's more expensive to run a truck to do that for a year, £70,000, £80,000 a year with the cost of the vehicle and all the rest of it. Uh, what is a bonus is that every product that come back does have the opportunity to be recycled, be repaired, um, rather than going to an incineration. I'm not sure how aware you are. We seem to spoke about triangles a lot today at various times, but the waste hierarchy, which is about how we dispose of waste, um, we all talk about recycling. Recycling is quite a way down the, 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 the waste hierarchy. We should be reducing how much we use, so if we don't use it in the first place, brilliant. If not, can we repair it and can we reuse it? If not, can we recycle it? So there is an argument on a sort of ethical level about whether the, the bulky waste service for a cost to do that and actually improve the recycling rate in, in the process as well. So that's one of the options that could be considered, that could be looked at. Um, I think, and it, it came from reading this paper and writing this paper and some of my personal thoughts that we shared with Vicky, you could do a hybrid version of this where you integrate certain elements into being collected, certain things which you know are absolutely no use, man and beast, and they go into the back of the bin lorry. Um, I think there is an argument that what it did say to me, which I would actually put down as a recommendation personally, is we actually look to improve our comms at both authorities. 
because the more we can direct people to reuse and, re, um, and recycle programs, the more that we can actually say, well, okay, what do we do as a community? How do we engage? How do we tell you what to do? It's the right thing to do. You know, ethically, it's what we should do. I shouldn't be chucking out a wardrobe and going to the back of a bin lorry and being burnt if somebody that could make use of it can do. Um, I've, I've, I've got a similar question as an example. Litchfield, after the elections, we've got some carpets that they're throwing out and they've asked us to go and you know get rid of. And I've said, just, just, just stop a bit. Let's get down there and see what they're like because if they are any good, the chances are that we can actually get to a stage where it might be used for a charity, for a... Or, or whatever it is that we can actually reuse rather than rather than burning them. Um, the other thing that came up from my perspective, I just put my business head on at this stage, is we limit the number of collections that we can do. Uh, we can only collect so many items, we can only collect so many items on a round. I, from rereading this paper today when I went through it, that needs reviewing. I can't see why we can't collect five rather than four. I can't see why we can't actually say, well, okay, we can collect five while we're in that area. So the good news is by posing these questions, you've actually asked one or two questions that we will go back and answer directly, as, as well as the opportunity to try and find out what you would like us to look at with the service. Um, other little bits to put in, and realistically, it's the, just one that we do need to be aware of. Similar to garden waste, the collection of bulky items is a non-statutory um, requirement. We don't have to do it. Should we do it? There's the benefit of what is right to do versus the cost of doing something, but there is that, that discussion that, 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 that does need to be had. Um, I hope that makes sense. Vicky, you know a lot more about this. Is there anything else that I've missed up on there? No. Thank you very much. Any questions? I've got one. Um, if we didn't have this um, service, I think there would be an awful lot of fly, more fly tipping. But what I've noticed, and from um, councillors going around their areas, it, it's areas, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but areas where we have got higher proportions of disadvantage, where we have the higher levels of fly tipping. And I'm just wondering if it's the costs that put people off. And I don't know how we deal with that. I tend to agree, unfortunately, there is a correlation between fly tipping and, um, and income areas and depravity around certain areas. Not always, you know, I, I, we have some... I had a beautiful woman up in Newcastle of 20-odd tonnes of commercial waste in the middle of a beautiful walkway. But there is a comparison to it, and it could be that there is a link between it. Um, the reality is we are a cheap service. Uh, I, I did have an argument from a, a, a council elsewhere that changed their service, and they actually went on a different angle. They doubled the price, but agreed to go into the house to do it on a set day at a set time. Um, that's how far and wide you can go with it. You can take either option. I would tend to support your argument that if I can't afford to have my bulk waste collected, most people, and the vast, vast majority of people, wherever they come from, will still go to the, the household waste site and, and dispose of it. Um, I think, again, the other one that's worth bringing into the equation in the same area is, is White Van Man, and that scenario of household clearance. Um, and we do work with our enforcement teams to say, look, if you get a chance and there's fly tipping where you can prosecute, please do. Um, and that does help send a message across. Yeah, we do have a couple of um, reputable firms in Tamworth, Skip on Wheels and another one. I'm, I'm not promoting any any service at all, but um, where they will do that, and you can go and see their licences. But I am conscious that we get an awful lot of scrap metal merchants come round at any time, and you don't they're not actually sort of very friendly when you ask them about their licences. Anyway, Councillor Oates, you... Yeah, just pick a few points. I think you're absolutely right about uh, place areas with lower disposable income. Uh, and it leads me on to some questions in terms of how have we, or how have the levels been decided? And I'll give you an example. There's carpet on here, rolled up one room. But if you fit in your own carpet, 
it's likely you're doing that because you're on a lower income and not getting it fitted professionally where the professional takes the carpet away. But where do we get the one room from? A, a four metre by four metre room is significantly different from a, a, a set of stairs in terms of handling, in mm. terms of... And I'm using carpet as an example. Uh, but there are a few things on there that, are, that have figures next to them. I just wonder where those figures come from. And it relates back to your point about why do we say only four collections. Surely it should be when the vehicle is full. Uh, and it's about that, how do we sweat the asset to an extent? And just picking up on your final point there, Councillor Couchman, uh, in terms of scrap metal collectors. Am I right in my understanding that the present, during your, your, your intro, we take all our scrap metal and hand it over to household waste recycling centres to be disposed of? Is there any opportunity there for us to dispose of scrap which has qu which has a, a value attached to it and therefore subsidise uh, this service or, or whatever, you know, in terms of that broader commerciality? Uh, yes, and thank you very much on that. You've, you, you're right, the scenario of this room carpet is a lot, lot bigger than my, you know, back bedroom. Um, I think there's an element here that that's why you've asked him for a review of this and you've looked at this paper when he came forward and you've gone, Christ, we need to review this. Uh, the, the reason being that I think a lot of the idea about this service was run was probably put together at the outset of this joint wave service back in 2000 and... Help. 2010. 2010. And I think there's some historical stuff that's probably worth revisiting now to see whether it's the right way to go forward. Um... The metal that goes to the waste, uh, the household waste site, we do get weighed in, so it does come into the, uh, to our figures and we will get a recycling credit for. Um, so it will get captured up. So each tonne of recycling that we take to um, whatever product it is, there's a basket price and county do give a recycling credit. Uh, I also, just because my mind went back to the, the, the earlier point about when we're promoting and when we should be promoting what to do, I think there's an element in whether we can actually, or can't, but whether you can't promote certain individuals to say, what a great company, that's who we should be using. Mm -hmm. But I think we can start to actually just remind people and try to push the message that we should be using reputable. And people who haven't got licences tend to have a nasty habit that they do a great job clearing your house on the cheap. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they leave your addresses on the, uh, and you get prosecuted for it. But yeah. Very valid point. Stay them. Um, yeah, I agree that it's an important service and I don't think we should get rid of it. And I appreciate that from your kind of budget analysis and cost review that it on paper is affordable. However, it evidently, it's either people don't know about this service, they can't be bothered to use the service or it's not affordable because the amount of fly tipping that isn't necessarily fly tipping in um, a random area, it's just outside people's homes. So it's still on their private property. So us as councillors can't necessarily report it as fly tipping because it's on a private property, but there's a rotting sofa on, in someone's front garden. So it's that grey area that we also need to address. And I think what you've put in here is really good about... Uh, the promotion and the links with community groups. There's safe, there is, you know, a lot of groups within Tamworth. Tamworth has some fantastic charities that have vans and would be able to pick up things that people no longer want, obviously depending on the condition of things. But for example, the food bank um, in Glasgow, they have a van, they pick up things, um, they give away appliances when they can. So... I think whether it's someone, and I don't know who would do this, whether it's us councillors or whether it's someone on this service that would be able to take some time and create those links with these people in the community. So then it's taking the burden off not only the cost of people having to pay this, but the burden on you guys, how much you're having to do. If we've got groups that are willing to take things and need them, then we should create those links. Uh, again, can't, can hardly agree on it. Um, I know previous places, again, I'll come back to uh, Newcastle for the most recent, uh, I think Moreland's were as well. They were working with a company called Furniture Mine who did the service for them. I do know that recently they had to take it back in-house. 
Um, I'd need to chase up my colleague up north to find out what the reasons were. But there's certainly areas to explore to see whether there are alternatives. Um, there's also an element here, and I, I think I've made the point earlier, but I can't help but make it again, that this becomes whichever council in also gets into enforcement teams and your environmental teams because of an element that from our perspective somebody leaving you know their furniture in the middle of their garden is completely out of our jurisdiction we, we can't touch on it but there is a real element that this becomes to, to, to deal with these kind of problems becomes a joint approach between waste um, the environment teams um, and a little bit wider than just a bulky way so yeah thank you madam chair um going on to what you said earlier about encouraging people to reuse recycle would it not be i know it's going to be an overarching thing when i say this but wouldn't it be more prudent and it actually links into what councillor statham said about local groups and charities would it be prudent to look into perhaps repair shops as well if we've not got those implemented Yes. Uh, on the wish list of what you should do and what would be brilliant to do, um, there is an argument that simpler recycling comes in. You're trying to look at repair shops. You're trying to look at reuse. Because if we start talking about the circular economy and what we've got to do in the world, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm starting to probably get away from our operation into my own view of where the world goes, that is finite resource. So we've got to get a lot better as a society at repairing, reusing. And there are some very, very good examples of, uh, of councils and um, charities <coughs> that have done this kind of work. Um, I know that in Burntwood, uh, the lady who runs a repair shop on a Saturday morning, and they get so many items that go in, and they repair some and they work well. Um, the recycling centre, uh, it's, um, what's it called? I'm sorry, I'm flicking my fingers at you. Get flat. No, not Cannock, the, the one down the road. The Lower Farm. Lower Farm, Farm thank you. Yeah, yeah. They've got a repair yeah. shop and they've got a shop that actually sells this kind of uh, market. But community engagement and repair shops and reuse, difficult to get off the ground, but oh, we're really getting somewhere where we can get there. So I certainly agree. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Yeah, no, right. Councillor Adams. Hi, I've got um, a few questions. One is out at 90k, he then is surplus in that amount. He then is surplus, like profit or over amount we need. The second question is I've been looking at the items, what we can and cannot collect. And it's a bit weird. I mean, some of the items what I would expect is to be able to collect. You can't. Like, a met and sold fit freezers. You can take any other type of fit freezers, but not that type. Or garden panels. Or children playhouse. Or suitcases. And I find it a bit weird why you can't take a suitcase when he could take a TV or a monitor. I mean, it seemed a bit odd. I can understand some things like building wobbits and weights, but why can't I get rid of, I don't know, a suitcase? Uh, a third question is, one idea what I have, is why can't we have a ship every so often in different areas moving about the town where people can dump stuff. I mean, it would lower fly tipping if they got somewhere to actually do that. Like every so often you have a sip to, in one street, then you move it about. Again, some good questions there, Councillor Adams. Uh, the £90,000, the reality is uh, it, it's contributing towards the cost of the service. So we tend to find that income streams that we got going in, um, that's what they're doing. They're actually offsetting some of the costs that we've, we've got. Um, 
the list of products, I think that's probably going back to that scenario about reviewing the service that we've got. I can answer American fridge freezers, and that's on a manual handling perspective. Uh, the reason we have bigger items going into the back of a bin lorry because there's two free men there, or ladies, that can actually pick it up and chuck it in. The vehicle that goes out uh, and collects the metal is a one-man crew, so trying to shift an American fridge freezer on your own is not is not particularly easy to do. There's also, the, there has been a, a common past that um, certain areas we end up with quite a long walk with a sack truck to get it back because of the nature of where the where we can park the vehicles versus where the disposal points are. Um, suitcases, I have absolutely no idea. Um, I think it's probably an element we review this lot going back and saying, okay, we can take that, we can't take that. Rubble, you, you pointed out, no, we can't. Um, but yeah, I'm actually along those lines. Why can I take a TV which has got um, cancer hazardous waste and I have to keep undercover, otherwise the EH uh, tell me off, but I can't collect a suitcase. I honestly have no idea. I think it's worth reviewing. Um, the concept about putting skips out into certain areas, um, I've seen it done in plenty of places. Uh, Vicky pointed out we have done it previously. Um, it can work um, because engagement in the community, you can have a lot of waste disposed of very quickly. Um, I've also seen it work where literally it's gone out there with a bin lorry sitting there to chuck it into the back of uh, and within 10 minutes it's there and you've got to get another bin lorry in because that much has come out. Uh, but the concept, if you can actually work with your community and say, well, tell you what, we've got a bin lorry sitting there or we've got a skip get in there or we've got a recycling, or whatever you can put out there, you can do it. And if you can engage with the community, it does come at a cost. Um, and it does need to involve county council. And again, part of the reason of that is because county council pay for the disposal. We are the collection authority. But there is nothing stopping us in theory running those kind of campaigns anywhere across uh, across Lichfield or Tamworth. Do you want to jump in? Would you like to follow that up? Uh, can I, before you go there, a bit? We do actually get involved in some of, like, the bring out your... I'm not saying don't be, you know what I mean. Been, yeah. Um, we've been asked to do a few of those in Litchfield and their community team um, reach, pay a recharge to us and we provide a, a man and a, a, a vehicle and a, they have those days where people bring their extra stuff on a Saturday and they pay for us to uh, to do that. So it is, it is something that we could do. We have the staff that are willing to work on a Saturday as long as we pay them. Council Adams, is that something that you'd like to see followed up? Yes, it is. I think it'd be a good idea to uh, lower fly tipping in many areas. Mm -hmm. Especially if we could do that for, that for free that well. That would be a very big bonus. Um, Mrs Goodwin, would that be a way that street scene could be involved? Because I know that they give out all the bags and the... Um, litter pickers and that for people who want that i'm just wondering i've seen that we've got quite a couple we've got a couple of big vans you know open back with the cages on i just wondered whether or not if if we couldn't get it through joint waste is it something that we want to explore oh what personally i want it to be explored would, would other members like it to come in no thank you madam chairman um i think you you referred to street scene and the role they play uh previous report we had residual waste tonnage including street sweeping we've mentioned fly tipping in this report i wonder how many because we haven't got the figure here and it's probably not a, a, a question you guys can answer now. I wonder how many of the items on these lists that should be bulky collections are collected by street scene. And the reason I raise this is there is a particular bin attached to a particular post, which I can take anybody to, 
And every week, there are large bulky items next to said bin. And every week, our diligent street scene guy pulls up at that bin, loads the back of his truck, and off he goes. And I'm convinced that it's coming from one particular household, and I'm convinced the operative has some sort of connection there, because it's not part of the bulky waste collection service. So I wonder how much bulky waste is picked up by street scene that therefore flies under the radar and we don't it does we, we don't identify it as fly tipping we don't identify it as part of the bulky waste scheme uh, so, that's, so that's a question which may not be answered now in terms of your previous point uh, with the area collections we used to have operation teamwork many years ago where the police would rock up and execute all the warrants highways would rock up and fill all the potholes we'd rock up and collect all the all, all the leftover detritus that fell by the wayside, but we have estates and areas which we've referred to earlier, which have brick-built sheds that are floor to ceiling with residual waste. And they are not going to be brought out. They're not going to be taken to the Household Waste Recycling Centre. They're going to be discovered when that house becomes a void and we are left with, with clearing that up. So if there's anything we can do to get those, those areas cleaned out, we, we should be trying it. Um. As, as you will be aware, but not all new members will be aware, um, Street Scene have now got a three-man team, well, three-person team, which go out to collect, basically, fly tipping. So it's, it stops the... It's going to come up at the next meeting that we're going to have. Um, but I was just thinking that, you know, a bit of joined-up uh, work in here would help because we working on our own, it's costing us money. If we worked with... Litchfield and improve the joint, uh, the bulky waste collection, that would save us money in, in the fly tipping. And I'm sure it would save Litchfield in the fly tipping. And it's just somewhere I think we need to look at in greater depth. Because, you know, the consequence of one is having a, a knock on effect to the other. They're not working in isolation. I'm happy if we have a working group because I think when you do the working groups as well you get a good set of information across a range of uh, responses. I couldn't respond off the top of my head because it wasn't what it was set up to do but as Councillor Alp said it is what they are doing regularly as amongst other things so yeah I'm happy to come back and we can have a chat. Right I'm happy to set up a working group and I'm happy to chair it if people are happy with that. Is there anybody else who'd like to join me? Right, Councillor Clark, Councillor Statham, Councillor uh, Adams, thank you very much. Um, right, we'll, we'll sort some dates out after this meeting. And if anybody else wants to join or wants to give us information, that's brilliant. And we'll open it to other councillors to give us information. Thank you. It's on this report right we've been asked to endorse the progress uh, and updates provided and i think a second one is that we've set up a working group yeah to look at the community yeah yes yeah. right can i have a mover thank you councillor wood seconder councillor stay them all in favor thank you that is carried Right, we now go to item nine, uh, item. Right, if anybody wants to leave, if you've done your time, thank you very much. <laughs> You're just that, just that sort of right. Sorry, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then we're coming to next briefing paper. Thank you very much for coming. Right. Does anybody need a, a comfort break or? Yep, yep. Right. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Right. Anybody else want a quick break?
which is the report of the um, Nature Recovery Declaration Briefing Paper. And in Councillor Foster's absence, I'm going to ask Anna Miller to introduce it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, this report this evening outlines the progress that's being made on Tamworth's Nature Recovery Declaration since it was made, and it went through full council right at the end of 2023. Um, and it signals Tamworth's commitment to halting nature's decline. So our, our Nature Recovery Declaration explains the steps that we will take as an authority to support nature recovery and it will contribute to the county-wide local nature recovery strategy in due course, which is currently being prepared by Staffordshire County Council. So as a bit of an update, since the declaration was made, um, there's been a further requirement for a biodiversity consideration to be made by the council as part of the biodiversity duty arising from the Environment Act dated 2021. The biodiversity duty outlines what steps local authorities should take towards nature recovery and is closely aligned with our nature recovery declaration. But it also contains some further requirements such as mandatory biodiversity net gain for all non-exempt new development. So as part of this report, um, a draft biodiversity consideration is presented to committee. You will find that in the appendix. Um, so whilst much of the work towards nature recovery declaration is still at a very early stage, there are several projects that are underway. Um, a number of those are in the report as, a, as an update. So work on the local nature recovery strategy and also um, the steps that the planning team have been making to incorporate biodiversity net gain, uh, which came into uh, planning legislation Earlier this year, it was delayed, but large sites and small sites are now covered formally by the legislation. So this paper just outlines some of the steps that the planning team have been undertaking to make sure that that workload is correctly incorporated into the way in which we receive applications and take decisions uh, with biodiversity as a very key consideration within that. Um, a number of um, actions are ongoing. We've got a working group across the authority with a number of directorates now, um, sort of working together to support the implementation of the Nature Recovery Declaration and also this consideration um, should it be approved through committee tonight. So I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Councillor Statham. Yeah, it's just about the uh, the tree thing. Hold on, bear with me. I'm just finding where I was at. <laughs> Sorry, there's so much in here. Um, I mean, I've, I've wrote it down. There's a quote you've used, uh, right tree, right place. Um, I think any councillor uh, in here is aware that there is a massive issue already with trees that we have. So, uh, yeah, I've found it. I've got it. Um, so if we're doing a, 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 what will be in this tree policy and strategy, um, if is it? I understand that it's tree planting, but if we've already got an issue with trees, I'm quite concerned that we're going to plant a load more trees, which are then going to become an, an issue in you know how many years. So I think all of us want to be reassured that this right tree, right place strategy is very clear and tight I mean that work hasn't started yet but it's in the nature recovery declaration as something that needs to be done and it's recognized that it's needs that it needs to be done um, nature recovery is about conserving uh, nature biodiversity but the duty is also now also about enhancing it as well um, but it's not a question of just planting a tree for the sake of planting a tree um, there's got to be a lot more thought and strategy that goes behind that and whilst we haven't worked out that detail um, one of the things that it would need to take into account is um, climate change for example so there's no point planting a tree of a particular species in that location knowing that we're going to have um, you know a lot, a lot wetter winters a lot drier summers or actually it might be the other way around um, because actually that tree species isn't drought resistant or that tree species doesn't work well if it's going to flood in a particular location. So it is it is taking into account 
some of those other bigger issues as well in terms of what goes where. So that's why it's right tree, right place. It's not just a one size fits all approach to it. So the new government are currently consulting on a new version of the MPPF, which is a national planning framework, and they have put into there that they want a lot of new houses to be built, but they also want the, the streets to be tree-lined as part of climate adaptation. Um, and so that will be something that the government is looking for us to implement. So obviously, if we're going to have developments that are going to have tree-lined streets, we need to put the right trees in there that don't cause problems with light, with roots and so forth and that's why we want a, a right tree, right uh, place policy which the Staffordshire wide local nature recovery strategy is also looking at so there may be something coming from them, if not we've got a new tree officer and we've been working with him and talking to him at an early stage about that as well. Any other questions? <coughs> Councillor Price. Thank you Chair. Anna, can we talk about road verges, please? So, <laughs> in uh, on page 377, so uh, number seven, road verges, it talks about safety and visibility priorities, um, developing highway verge cutting regimes to maximise the potential, etc., etc. There's a, there's a particular stretch of, of road in Tamworth at the minute, which it looks like we've just, rather than um, developing a verge cutting regime, we've just given up cutting it um, and there are in my opinion um, particular safety and visibility issues at points of that stretch of road so what what is the current policy in Tamworth with, with regards to that and um, I mean it, you know um, how do we address them issues with with this policy um, Um, and when I went up to see um, the Mark at the uh, at the depot, he was saying that ha that had to be cut very very soon because he was aware of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but, but, yeah, that is the issue. Yes. I'm glad to hear that's being cut because the amount of times I've had to put the brakes on late because as you're approaching that. Um, but but the, I think the, the question's more around like in, in the future, how does this policy feed into that and how can we ensure that the, the regimes are frequent enough uh, to make it safe and visible through this policy? I, I'm going to be honest and say I'm not responsible for cutting road verges. <laughs> I'm just going to. I'm just going to say that. Um, um, that that is a, a wider strategic question, though, which I think is really important. There is a fine balance, isn't there, between uh, road safety and and as the declaration says, it, at, at, once you've satisfied safety and visibility priorities, then look at how road verges can be positively managed for biodiversity and it there has been studies that have supported that road verges whilst on face value don't look particularly valuable for biodiversity actually they are incredibly valuable if left but you're right there is a point between what you can and can't do which means things need to be safe so there's there will be a piece of work around that we've started that with the uh, working group actually and i know i was talking to mark the other day and he was talking about potentially um, putting in red clover because it doesn't get high but it is incredibly biodiverse uh, friendly so he's very aware and, and actually when we've been having these discussions it's always the first thing he says is I can't leave it long there yeah. like I say it's um, that that particular area but but yeah it's good to hear that we're looking at different things I mean it, it does look really nice and, and, I, and I think it, it, it does encourage that biodiversity that we're, that we're looking at. Um, but, but there is that, um, that balance, isn't there, between what, what we want to get from it and, and then obviously the safety of, of the public as well. Um, so yeah, good to hear. Thanks for, thanks for that. <coughs> the two things. Uh, one on the trees, can we make so it, we don't use one or two type of trees, so it's actually more divert. 
so you get at the pop of water burglary and set up like the painting all one tree all around it world and that's it instead of having a mix of different trees and the second point is because we get a lot of pot on with trees <laughs> well it, can we actually take responsibility of tree won't we actually plant it so if the roots are growing out of control it, our responsibility Thank you. We'll, we'll take those points away. And so when we come to writing that particular piece, which I may even come back through a committee as part of this um, quarterly update now to the Nature Declaration um, implementation, then you know we can make sure that we include those uh, concerns that you've raised. Thank you. Councillor Oates, you wanted to come in. Yeah, thank you. Um, pick up on the point that... Councillor Price raised, and I wasn't talking about that particular verge. Uh, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. We need to make sure that we are managing our open spaces correctly, and we're not using this as an excuse for brambles to grow wildly, and, and the place just becomes a litter trap, completely opposite to the biodiversity we're, we're trying to attract. If you look at some of the areas of Tamworth, we've got some great volunteer groups who keep some areas fantastic, and they're also still accessible to, to us mere human beings. Whereas other areas of the town are literally just litter traps where they've been left to, to, to overgrow. Um, and the point about trees, yeah, it's great planting them. We need to get rid of some as well because they're in a state where they're causing other issues. Um, within the papers, it talks about 30 by 30, which is 30% of council-owned land will be managed. How big is that? Uh, what, what is 30% of Townsborough Council's owned um, green open spaces? I've actually looked into this and we're I'll already managing about 50% of our green open spaces for nature. So we can tick that box then? Yeah. Excellent. But how big is that? Is that a football field? Is that? It's a, I think water? it was about 10 hectares. Oh, right, okay. It just seemed vague as 30, you know. Oh. No, thank you. I think if you go over the parks... And I'm very um, knowledgeable about Wigginton Park because that's where I walk my dog. All the areas where there's trees, what they've done is underneath, is instead of um, cutting all the grass and the foliage, they've let that grow so that it's sort of, it's a bit wild. But then it, you've still got all the other open spaces being cut. So you can see that. So you can see where you've got your, your biodiversity parts. Um, because I've, along with my fellow dog walkers and stuff, you do get the odd complaint from people. And I've been able to say, well, actually, that's part of our biodiversity strategy. Uh, oh. <laughs> so it's very important that we sort of like educate everyone, but also be educated ourselves. And where I take your point about brambles, I think not to preempt, but next week's, next month's meeting, we sh I think we're going to put the open waste, uh, open spaces first on our agenda to give that, you know, the um, time it needs to be discussed. Councillor Clark. I'm, I'm glad we started with the highways, really, in a way, because it's something uh, we can attack the safety issues that occur. We do have too many accidents in and around Tamworth, partly because of our road structures. But I think if we, for example, I know on motorways abroad, they will put a lot of different trees up to keep you alert when you're driving along a long, boring road. I know we don't have too many long, boring roads, but it's a health and safety issue in some respects. And also, because we had a lot of agricultural land uh, in certainly in my area of town with the Stony Delft, Belgrave and so on, we do end up inheriting trees that are no longer perhaps um, as useful as they might be. And we have to make, well, my area of the park is now a thicket because nobody did any of the wonderful training that we had. Nobody cuts down the self-sitters. Nobody keeps the brambles at bay. So when you, you're going down your footpath cycleway, your brambles are this high. Uh, and when you're trying to walk on the footway, you have to walk over weeds. Weeds are very bad for children and uh, childhood asthma. 
and this is a sort of safety measure that I think we can incorporate, I hope, into a really good strategy and programme. And I think if we can show that we're doing this, we will get those voluntary groups together. You know, and Staffordshire Wildlife Trust particularly are very good at coming out, giving you the basics of what you should be doing and telling you what not to do. You know, for example, don't go up a ladder because the tree looks like it needs a prune. Leave it to the council. So I think from a safety, health and safety, and the CO2 uh, removal, that I think that's going to be really... I just think this is a terrific project. So thank you, ladies. Who's next? No one's next. No? no? Nothing else to say? I haven't got anything else to say either. Right. What we've got to do now is, well, we've got to decide whether we wish to um, approve the biodiversity consideration, which is set out in Appendix 1, and two, endorse the progress and updates provided. Right. Can I have a mover? Councillor Wood. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Clark. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. So can I thank you for your attendance and um, you can go home now if you want. <laughs> I'm sorry it's taken you so long. Well, it's taken so long for you to answer us. Right, we now come to working group updates, item 11. Councillor Price. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do have an update for you this meeting, if you bear with me. Um, first of all, thank you to uh, Councillor Statham for taking and writing up the notes on this much appreciated um so we met last night um for the first time um of the working group in this iteration of uh, of member makeup uh, there was myself councillor wood uh, and county councillor jeremy oates um we looked at what um at, at what we wanted to uh, achieve from from the working group uh, and what the aim of the working group was which is to establish if we've got sufficient HGV facilities uh, in Tamworth and address the issues of uh, HGV drivers parking in residential areas. Um, we we discussed some key issues um, that have have already been identified um, in previous um, in previous groups. Um, Council Oates gave us an update on um, the the parking issues around Ventura Park Road um, and shared some plans um, with us with regards to um, county installing double yellow lines um, and we there were some concerns raised about whether that would simply move the parking issue elsewhere um, we also discussed um, an application that Brakes had made to change the use of the car park um, and how that went straight to uh, delegation um, and we discussed how this is essentially something that needs to be addressed um, when the constitution is reviewed. Um, we talked about uh, parking on other industrial estates, uh, such as Litchfield Road Industrial Estate, Amington Industrial Estate, um, and we've identified that we need to um, investigate this and identify if there is, in fact, um, a problem. Um, nobody within the working group, uh, none of us, uh, are councillors in them areas um, and I haven't received um, and haven't received any um, direct resident complaints about them industrial estates um, we spoke about Tamworth service station um, the fact that there are some HGV um, facilities there um, and discussed whether they're in fact uh, used um, is there an issue with regards to it's too far away for the drivers um, when they are looking for somewhere to park? Um, and we discussed um, whether there are facilities outside of the boundaries um, that drivers could use. So um, there's, there's still some work for us to do. Um, we've got some action points to, to work on um, with, around identifying um, where the provisions are in our area and, and the wider area. Um, and as I said, investigating the issues of parking on the other industrial estates across Tamworth um, and then looking at the provisions that are already there and why they're not being used. So we looked at things around communication, um, signposting, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's 
there's definitely um, a piece of work here for us to continue to look at um, and still quite a bit of work for us to do. So with your permission, Chair, I'd like to carry on with the working group and continue to report back into committee um, and up to such a point where we've got some recommendations uh, to bring back to you. Thank you. Can I just say something? Yeah, I just want to add some more detail to a particular issue that's been discussed in the working group. Um, on Dunstall Park, there has been issues with Ventura Park Road probably since it was ever built. Um, it, this was flagged to me during my um, election campaign in May, and it was the number one thing that residents were talking about. Um, alongside that, speeding and littering. Um, so I've been working with um, our MP, Sarah Edwards, who recently did a survey to residents. Um, the survey's gone out. We've had a lot of responses, um, and she has now uh, contact the, contacted the borough uh, and the county in relation to the issues um, of littering, speeding, and parking on Ventura Park Road. Um, I've been liaising with residents as well, myself, um, to encourage them to keep talking to us. Uh, I think it's great to have, um, you know, Jeremy Oates, Councillor Jeremy Oates, on this committee so that we can continue to work together to try and find a resolution. And I was very reassured to hear that there are already plans in the works. Um, I just want to raise a couple of things that residents have spoken to me about today. Um, that Councillor Oates can take away and uh, mull over uh, in his county position. Um, a few residents have suggested a one-way system um, through the end of Mile Oak um, Road rather than it being a dual yellow line solution. Um, I don't know whether this is the answer, um, but I wanted to put it on public record that I am voicing residents' concerns and uh, hopefully... Um, Councillor Oates can take that away uh, and bring that to the county. But other than that, um, the problem is hopefully going to be resolved. Residents are being listened to. And I think it's really good that we're taking a collaborative approach with both the MP and county councillors to hopefully um, bring an end to this problem for residents. Um, thank you, Chair. Respond. My daughter lives on that estate and I regularly go and visit her and it's a pain. Um, if you go up during the day by the, where, the gar uh, where all the car garages are, you can't get by. Um, you take your life in your hands when you move out to see if there's any cars coming. The, the one up from the, the other roundabout is much easier, but again, you've still got parking all on one side. So uh, anything that can be done and also for the benefit of the uh, HGV drivers, because I think it's very important that if they are working all day and driving across our motorways, that they have ample rest and that uh, they have you know, proper washing facilities and everything else that goes along with that. Right. Sorry, just quickly to come back to what you've just said, I think I do want to reiterate that it is about both the residents and the HGV drivers, because you know, they if then they haven't got the facilities that they need, then we need to find out why they're not using the facilities that we do have. Um, and I think one of the key issues at the moment is that there's a primary school that's about to open on that estate. And if it isn't safe for drivers, then it isn't safe for children walking past it, in my opinion. Um, so it has to be addressed. And I think it's good that we're getting pushed from all sides to get this resolved. Just to compound it even further, there's a lovely children's play park being built right by the uh, roundabouts. Yeah. It's just something else. Sorry, can't... Uh, no, no um, I'll take all the points on board, Chair. Um, like I say, I think that the, there's definitely a, um, a, a fair amount of work for us to continue going at and, and, and looking at. Um, and I would hope by the end of this piece of work, we've got some... Um, some valuable um, recommendations to bring back um, to committee, um, which which will help um, to alleviate some of these issues that, that we've got uh, across the borough. Um, 
Yeah, and 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 like I say, um, with, with your permission, um, I'd like um, we we'd like to continue to work on that. Yeah, so. Yeah, just that the consultation on the proposal that we analyse is now live. So if residents want to respond to that with their feedback, just follow the link on the County Council website. Uh, in terms of it being a problem, I'd hate to say I was the guy that sat at the planning meeting. I think Councillor Sheree People was with me at the time and said, this needs sorting before it's built, because mm. otherwise it'll either be me or Sheree that will have to deal with the problem in years to come. Mm. And guess what? Yes. It's landed on my lap. But this is the whole problem, isn't it, with infrastructure not being built before things ever. Right. Can we? I'm going to thank you very much, both of, well, all of you, for the work you've put in so far, and I can see that it's be an ongoing process. So look forward to your recommendations in due course, and I'm glad that you've all got the residents and the HGV drivers' uh, interests at heart. Right. We now go to forward plan. Now, have you seen anything on the forward plan that you'd like to add to committee work plans? And I think looking at what we've got coming up for this uh, committee anyway, we're, at the moment we're quite full because we've taken three items tonight, it's taken two hours, and I don't think we've given the third item maybe as much justice as we could have done, you know, because it wants to get sort of backed up like that. Right. Is there anything that you think is coming? Right. Councillor Wood. Just a quick one looking on your screen, sorry, Chair. Um, we've got the improving water quality within the rivers in Tamworth. That says to be confirmed. Could yeah. we possibly put that potentially on the 29th of January? Because there seems to be only one item on there at the moment, quarterly updates. But I think yeah. there's something else coming, it's isn't done. there? Yeah, well, I also thought, it yeah. might, because of that piece of work, we, you know, we're going to try and get a couple of groups, and it might be better for that to be a single item, sort of maybe yeah so um, but yeah i'll come back when we get everything we might have to have an extra meeting yeah 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 right any anything else right okay in that case yeah, just right um as you know we've got review of the heritage engagement officer post future high street fund update maintenance of estates and open spaces including trees which i want to uh, highlight as the main item so we're going to look at the other two and just we may we may j rejig we may not rejig the agenda um are you happy with the work plan as it is so far yeah, yeah. okay right well i'd like to thank you all for attending tonight and i declare the meeting closed at just before eight o'clock <laughs>